First of all, let me thank the TCAM for inviting me here to talk to you um, in this forum, Aquaculture and Fisheries 2017, a good subject, very important subject that we will be discussing for two days. Um, I've been asked to talk about 2030, feeding the world and the role of aquaculture. I changed the title a little bit, feeding the 9 billion, because we all know there's going to be a little over 9 billion people by the year 2050. The world population is increasing at a rate so that we will have the challenge of feeding in 20 years to 30 years time and more than 3 billion people more than now. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering where to begin my talk. I thought, let me start talking about the United Nations, the role of United Nations in feeding the world because I've been working for the UN for 23 years. I was based in Rome, working on aquaculture globally, and finally heading the aquaculture division of FAO for several years, and working in many parts of the world, and some, almost all of your countries I have visited and worked before. Then I thought, no, let's start talking about aquaculture, because aquaculture is important, but I'll tell you why in a minute, and also an industry which is growing at a rate much more than any other food producing sector in the world. Then, um, then I thought, how can I say something? Okay. Um, then, of course, aquaculture is fish, so we thought, let's talk about fish. Then, fine, we always talk about fish. Why we talk about fish? Because fish is a food, and fish is a very important food for people. So we are talking about feeding nine billion. Why fish is the question. This is exactly what we're going to talk about the next two days. You have a theme about biodiversity and aquaculture. And I'm not going to touch about biodiversity in my 25 minutes, but I'm going to talk about talk to you about fish, how important the fish, how we import the fish for people, where do we stand with respect to fish, who eats fish and who doesn't eat fish, how much fish we need for the future, and where are we going to get that fish, and we'll be able to get that fish for 2050. Um, aquaculture, I'm not going to preach about aquaculture because you all are aquaculturists. Aquaculture is an extremely important commodity or, or industry, very diverse, unlikely uh, the terrestrial animal production livestock. We have many species, 253 species or 300 and something species. Almost 25 species are mainly produced compared to terrestrial animals, very small number of species. All environments, marine, freshwater, brackish water, if we produce fish, and multitude of systems. We have very unsophisticated, simple backyard systems going into very highly sophisticated industrial aquaculture. Many practices, you know, we have rice fish culture, we have polyculture, we have all kinds of different practices. Different scales of operation, it could be a half a hectare of a backyard farm to a hundred hectares of commercial integrated farm. So aquaculture is one of the most diverse food producing sectors in the world. In fact, there is no comparison to any other terrestrial food producing sectors in the world. Still, in my opinion, I used to say 80%, but 
But now the corporate sector is in, improving and increasing in the world. So we still get about 70% of the production come from small scale aquaculture. What is small scale aquaculture? I'm not going to define you. But small scale aquaculture is basically small scale means a half a hectare to one hectare ponds operated by families, no um, hired labor. You just basically, it's a, like a family driven systems. Some of you coming from Indonesia, very, very familiar with that and also some other places where you're coming from. So this small scale sector contributes nearly 70%, if not even more, to the global production. Some of the, work, the numbers that I'm going to show, give you today come from this document, the State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture 2016, which is an FAO's flagship document which comes every two years, which provides an overview of the status of the world agriculture and fisheries. Um, the agriculture component of that I used to sort of put together for many years and while I was in Rome and now the latest which came out in 2016 and I'm using 2015 FAO statistics for you to, uh, for the next 25 minutes for you to tell you about agriculture. SOFIA, the State of the World Fisheries and Agriculture 2016 says, world per capita fish supply reached a new record high of 20 kilograms in 2014. So in 2014, on average, a person in the world ate 20 kilograms of fish. Why? Thanks to vigorous growth in aquaculture, which now provides half of all fish for human consumption. We got two things. One, we reach 20 kilograms per person per year in 2014, and 50% of the fish that you eat now come from aquaculture. It's a, it's a major milestone for aquaculture industry. You can proudly say that the industry that we are working on is now contributing 50% to the food. And so, slight improvement in the fisheries management over the past decade has also contributed a little bit. We believe in the coming decades, by 2030, about 15% of the required um, the demand for fish might come from additionally from fisheries management. If you look at this graph, it's very clear. The blue, um, yes. So this is fisheries, capture production. This is aquaculture, including plants. Remember, aquaculture is not only animals. There are plants also, seaweeds. Coming from Indonesia, you're very familiar with that. And we produce 160 million tons in 2015. Altogether, 200 million tons of fish. 200 million tons of fish in 2015. World ate 200 million tons of fish. Now, the if you look at food fish, 76.6 million tons, like when in 2015, 29 million tons of plants, 41 million tons of non-food products. Non-food products are like uh, the, the aquatic products that are not going into food, uh, pearls and various other things. And the totally 106 million tons worth of 163 billion dollars. So the industry, agriculture industry, the value in 2015 was 163 billion dollars. If you look at the agriculture share for global aquatic animal production in 2000, Aquaculture contributed 25 percent, 25.7 percent. In 2015, it contributes to 45.3 percent to the global animal, aquatic animal production, not food only, global aquatic. So you can imagine over a 15-year period, the sector has almost doubled its production and its contribution. If you look at the per capita consumption. In 1960s, on average, a person ate less than 10 kilograms of fish. Today, 
on average a person eats 24 kilograms of fish. So you can imagine from 1960 to 2015, of course it's a 50 year period, it has more than doubled. So a commodity consumption is doubling the volume over half a, half a century is big. It's absolutely big. We are talking about 7 billion people in the world. In 2013, fish contributed 6.7% to the total per capita protein intake in this world. Total protein. Total protein is animal and plant both. Altogether, total protein only 6.7%. But when you look at <coughs> total animal protein, fish contributes little over 16% protein. But this is the global average. But this changes from 50, more than 50% in some countries. Philippines, Indonesia to that extent, and some other Sri Lanka. And going down to 2% in some countries like Benin, you know, sort of in, in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, the role of fish as a, as a provider of protein for food is extremely significant. Fish is highly nutritious and some species of fish we know for sure scientifically by research is proven that more nutritious and more important than terrestrial meat. In fact, the value, nutritional value of fish, I will come to you in a minute, are more important for the first thousand day of life, which is the nine months of ten months of pregnancy and the first two years of child. So during that period, eating fish adequately will provide certain amount of certain types of nutrients which are not, not which will not be able to replace by anything else and providing an extremely important nutritious nutrients for brain development particularly and the mental and brain development. When you look at fish compared to the other terrestrial animal production systems or animals, no, it's very clear that fish has a better, what we call, uh, environmental footprint. So, conversion efficiency, if you look at beef, swine and fish on, on the left-hand side, and emissions, gas emissions from beef, swine, poultry, fish and shellfish. Shellfish, in fact, is negative. There is no emission. It absorbs things from the, from the environment. So fish is far superior to any other terrestrial animal production systems and some donors who have been supporting protein development, protein for the world are now thinking, shall we continue to support grazing animals, small ruminants or shall we, continue, shall we support more for fish? Uh, this table shows you feed and protein. Um, conversion efficiency of major animal foods, dairy, carbs, eggs, chicken, pork, beef. If you look at the fish is always better than other commodities. So fish is nutritious. Fish has unsupplementable nutrition qualities. Fish is far superior in terms of emission in terms of environmental impacts, in terms of uh, resource use compared to any other terrestrial products. So fish has its place confirmed as one of the top species for food, for now and for future. If you look at here, once again, the nitrogen and phosphorus emissions. If you look at the beef, pork, chicken, fish, where we are, and of course by valves, there is absolutely no emission. It's negative. So we 
are talking about an industry and a sector where we produce fish which is uh, environmentally sustainable and friendly. Fish is one of the most traded commodities in the world. Compared to many other commodities, fish trade is one of the most. And both imports and exports, if you look at from this, you can see how countries are importing and exporting. Uh, here is your imports and exports. So it's a commodity that moves. Incredible movement of fish. Some fish, eggs are made in one country. The animals are grown in another country. They go back to another country to process. They go back to another country to sell. Of course, the carbon footprint is very high when it is moved from place to place. But having said that, the value of the commodity allows such level of movement because it's very valuable. Um, World agriculture production food fish by continent. If you look at what I wanted to show is this is Asia. Eighty-nine point three percent of the world fish is produced in Asia. So ninety percent come from Asia. You have every right to talk about it because you produce ninety percent of fish in the world. If you look at this is Africa, three point six percent of the world. If you look at well, the growth is sorry, 2.3 percent, and uh, Oceania is is, is, a, is a Pacific Islands and you know very little. But having said that, the important thing is here, 90 percent, and the other important thing is Africa, which is producing very small amount of fish, yet one of the most least fish eating continents in the world. So. Africa particularly will require more fish in the coming decades. Otherwise, we believe African fish consumption will further deteriorate and it will reduce by another 50% over the next 20 years. So, if you do that, if that happens, that particular nutrient, that particular nutrition, it will be deprived by the people living in the African continent. Um, so, the SOFIA 2016 says, recent reports by high-level experts, international organizations, industry and civil society, representatives all highlight the tremendous potential of the oceans and inland waters now, and even more so in the future, to contribute significantly to food security and adequate nutrition for a global population expected to reach 9.7 billion in 2050. So there is no ambiguity. There is no question. There is no uh, about that 9.7 million billion people in 2050 will require more fish and they will be eating more fish which we will have to produce more fish and that the role of the fish in feeding that 9 billion is well understood now. The question is, can we make it? We have a solid foundation for aquaculture development globally. We had in 2014 the second world conference on nutrition where all leaders of the world came together to discuss and see how best we can improve global nutrition. The two people in that, in this is one, my form, my director general of FAO, uh, <coughs> present director, and the lady on the side, if you were any of you know, Melinda Gates. This is Bill Gates, the wife of Bill Gates, who is the co-chair of the Gates Foundation. Gates Foundation contributes, on average, $29 billion to global development in the biggest donor at the moment. Um, so Rome Declaration says world leaders renewed their commitment to establish and implement policies aimed at eradicating malnutrition and transforming food systems to make nutritious diets available to all. 
In that declaration, it was very clear that they mentioned fish as one of the commodities which will transform food system to make nutritious diets avoiding, so available to people. In 2015, September, the Sustainable Development uh, United Nations to got together and this developed what we call Sustainable Development Goals. You all are working, government personnel, private sector, various civil society agencies are working on the what we call a uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There are There are 17 aspirational objectives with 169 targets expected to guide actions of the governments, international agencies within the 15 years of 1916 to two, sorry, 2016 to 2030 on how the global development should take place. And if you look at the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, all these are in here, right? Poverty alleviation and uh, hunger, uh, good health, quality of education. You can link fish into every sustainable development goal. If you look at these directly, at least seven sustainable development goals has direct linkages to fish. Fish and the oceans. So, we are talking about a commodity and an industry which has enormous potential and not only potential, responsibility to contribute to the global development. Let's talk about the feed, feeding the 9 billion. This chart came from the World Research Institute. We need to increase the food production by 60% to feed that 9 billion people. Increase production by 60%, more than half of what we have now. Still, we have the same size of a planet, same resources, same space, same land, same water. We Already, 28% of the people in the world are involved in ag agriculture, food production. Agriculture currently emits about a quarter of the carbon in the world. We still have to increase the production by 60% in keeping engaging people more than one third and trying to reduce a quarter of the carbon that emits by the food producing sector. This is an extremely daunting task and that's the very reason why the United Nations started to think about how important the global development and the sustainable development goals, particularly looking at feeding the 9 billion. If you look at this graph, you can see this is uh, South East, Southern Asia. This is uh, East, sorry, this is I think Eastern Asia. So uh, the idea is this is this is num uh, the changing distribution of hunger in the world. This is 1990. This is 2014. Southern Asia, 1990. 290 million people in hunger. 19, 2014, 281 million people in hunger. Only we managed to reduce by 10%, 10 million people. Yet, when you look at the regional share for South Asia, it has increased 28.8 to 35.4% of the world living in South Asia will be in hunger or in hunger now. So if you look at carefully South Asia and if you look at 
Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 17.4% in 19, 27.7% now. The global share of poverty and hunger, although we managed to reduce from 1 billion to 795 million over 25 years, still the regional shares in Africa, particularly in South Asia and Eastern Asia, has increased. This trend will continue. There will be more hungry people in South Asia. There will be more hungry people in Africa than now in 20 years' time. And it is the responsibility and the, of the rest of the world to ensure that they, are, they will be fed. In that quest, fish will play a very major role. Um, this one I'm trying to show you how animal source food are consumed in the regions. The highest consumption of fish is in Asia, except 4%. We consume more fish, we produce more fish. If you look at Africa, this much, and you can see it from here. And when you look, this is the growth in overall requirements for fish in the future. If you look at, once again, the, the, the region where fish are consumed has one of the most significant requirements of fish for the future. So we are trapped in poverty, we are trapped in a, what we call a food trap. Food is required, food is not enoughly produced, food will require more in the coming years and there is no adequate supply. Um, let's look at the supply and demand for the next 30 years. There are several models looked at the future of fish in the world. IPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, produced a document called Food Fish to 2020 in 2003. That was 13 years ago. OECD and FAO, Agriculture and Outlook, came up with again another forecast in 2012 to 2021, in about four years back. Or you see the FAO fish model came out in 2014. World Bank, IFRI, FAO fish to 2030 came in 2013. And FAO 2017 did a recent analysis and a model, it is still not actually it's in press, that looked at what would be the requirements of fish by mid-20s to 30. The forecast, the latest FAO forecast 2017, early this year, says that given the price of consumer preference remaining same means that people will not change what they're going to eat. The prices, if the prices remain same, income growth would drive because everyone will have a little bit of more disposable income. That's how the world, except for very few pockets, everyone is having a little bit better, better purse. That would drive per capita fish demand from 20 kilograms now to 25 kilograms by 2025. So we are talking about 2015, 2016, 20.3 per kilo, per capita per year, demand, not the supply, the demand will increase to 25. So when you have an increased demand, you have to supply to that demand. That's the supply and demand theory. If you do not supply, the commodity price will increase. And only a certain number of the society will be able to access. It means that you will be depriving a large portion of the world of eating fish. If you look at here, there's demand. Highest demand is in China, 
51% of the world fish demand it will go to China in 2025. And of course, Southeastern Asia and South Asia and Africa, basically. Africa still has 7% of the team by 2025. The forecast for, for future, the income driven per capita fish demand, this is what we're talking about. Income driven means that because people have money, combined with the growth of the population, we are talking about 9 billion people, would drive the world fish demand from now of 200 million, 247 million tons, an additional 47 million tons. By 2025, which is no very far, it's only eight years from now, we'll be requiring additional 47 million tons in eight years' time. But if you look at that 27 million tons or 57% will be on this side, the marine fish and freshwater fish, and the other side, shellfish. The demand for crustaceans, demands for mollusks, demands for both fresh and marine fish, all will be equally important in the coming decades. The 19 million supply, as what we call business as usual, will also increase the production because the, because the sector is growing at around 4.5% a year. So if the normal growth goes and the difference between the income demand and the normal growth is 19 million. This 19 million fish supply growth generated by the trend growth, what we call business as usual, of the world agricultural production would cover only 40% of the projected demand, leaving 28 million tons of fish demand supply gap to my mid-20s. So we will require 40 million, out of which 19 million will be generated to the normal growth, still leaving 28 million tons of a gap. Following its recent trends, world agriculture will grow 4.5% per year from now until 2025. If that continues, if you want to bridge that 28 million tons of the gap between supply and demand, you have to increase the rate of growth of aquaculture to 10% from what is now is 4.5%. So in other words, if you do not increase the rate of growth of the sector by or doubling the rate of the growth sector, you will be able to bridge that 28 million tons of a demand supply gap by over the next eight years. It's an incredibly daunting task. If you look at some of the demand supply gaps. If you can see, once again, Asia is the most important. These are the highest demand areas, of course, United States, and here is Korea, Japan, you know, sort of, and to some extent, uh, China. Can we achieve this? Can we make that 28 million? That's the question, right? You all are sitting here. You're going to go back. You will be working with people. You'll be working with producers. Yes, I think we can. Let's see. We need to optimize the use of the resource and the efficiency because, as I said, there is nothing more going to come to increase the production by 28 million. You have to manage with what you have. There's nothing else you're going to come. So the same amount of land, same amount of water, or less water, or less land, but yet increase the production by one eighth. So cost of production has to be reduced somehow, otherwise you will not be able to compete in the international markets or even to the regional markets or national. If you don't compete, the producers will lose, means that production will go down. Right? So I will talk about it, but research 
innovations are extremely important for reducing the cost of production. What? How can we reduce the cost of production? In 2013, no, 2010, we eradicated rinderpest. Rinderpest is a livestock disease, you all know. In 2010, we eradicated rinderpest, like smallpox for humans. Today, we are almost at the doorstep of eradicating poliomyelitis. Polio. Very few cases a year is now recorded and I believe within next 10 years we will eradicate polio in the world. While we are eradicating some diseases of livestock, and human, we are talking about new diseases in fish. Tilapia virus spreading rapidly poses threats to global food security. This is 2017 June. My personal look, I have been to six countries over the past two months to look at this tilapia lake virus uh, outbreaks in, the, in six countries. Africa, Latin America, and <coughs> Asia. I, I don't know, I don't want to alarm, but I also seen some mortalities in Sri Lanka, in, um, in lakes, and I have, my personal feeling is, it is well worth checking what's going on, because it will well be this virus is in Sri Lanka. It may not be, but it's well worth checking. We are working in Bangladesh, we are working in Thailand, we are working in uh, Zambia, we are working in Ghana, we are working right now in Kodo, Israel, and losing 20 to 25% of the production currently. 20 to 25% of the production. We are talking about increasing production globally, we are talking about feeding the 9 billion, and we are also talking about virus killing 25% of the production. Reducing disease risk is one of the most important things for meeting that demand supply gap. We need good diagnostics, we need a good research and for production of vaccines and various other remedies which we can reduce the risk of disease. We need good quality seed. If not, we cannot make aquaculture. We need good strains, we need a resistant strains, we need to work on genetics. We need to look at emerging diseases, we need to work on research. This is a very interesting graph. This is the production of salmonids in Norway. And the blue lines are the use of antibiotics in aquaculture. From here, 1993, now they were using 50 tons of antibiotics in 1987. Today they are using 50 kilos of antibiotics. Why? Two vaccines were developed. How? By research. While you are here, what we are talking about for future, the research. Probably you heard about Aquabounty, the salmon, the fast growing salmon. 20 years, United, United States Congress debated whether this genetically modified salmon should be put in the market or not. Finally, late last year, the Congress decided to give the permits to produce this genetically improved salmon in the United States. This genetically improved salmon, originally made by a tinkering of the gene by a company called Apple Bounty, grows 10 times faster than the normal salmon. 
today production approval for the united states and market and consumption and production market and cons sorry market and consumption approval for the canada both already in place i'm not saying that whole world is going to use gmo salmon but the trend is that we are looking at faster growth more growth and more production still there are perceptions issues around agriculture people are questioning agriculture is sustainable or not people are questioning can agriculture really contribute to improving nutrition people are talking about can agriculture help reducing poverty and improving food security there are questions asked some people are still not convinced you know can agriculture really help is it poor of the poor no poor of the poor cannot do anything on agriculture because you need a piece of land to do agriculture poor of the poor will not have a piece of land but one segment of the world definitely can improve by agriculture and if you look at this particular person fund in 2014 in a document came in agriculture can agriculture benefit the extreme poor and he says household incomes of project participants rose significantly which was attributed to the increased share of agriculture and related enterprises from 15% in 2007 nearly to 30% in 2009 in terms of annual annual household income this are people who even did not have land to make agriculture in bangladesh the results of the present study says contradicts the prevailing view that agriculture is inappropriate for landless socially marginalized and extremely poor communities by demonstrating its relevance to improving livelihoods diversified approach to followed by interventions to tailor to needs and capacities of target households so it is clear and it is now understood that agriculture can help almost every segment of the society provided that you tailor me to that particular segment of the society this document came early this month this year i think 2017 march very interesting paper higher fish but lower micronutrient intake this is something that we need to think we increase fish production most of the fish production increase come from freshwater fish carps and tilapia when you have more money in your pocket when there is more fish in the market people will go and buy more fish and increase the consumption by one or two meals a week of fish but we all have some traditional fish that we like the little fish the small fish this group found that our results challenge the conventional narrative that increases in food supply lead to improvement in diet and nutrition what they say is people when you have fish available people will buy them but depriving their traditional fish <coughs> consumption of local species which are much more nutritious than your freshwater carps and tilapia i'm not saying that carps and tilapia are not nutritious they are but there are little fish in this country we have little fish that we like to eat in bangladesh you have mola in bangladesh you have professor knows all about it and this fish are important so this work in bangladesh shows that by allowing by having access to large fish people will not reduce the eating than normal um, what we call traditional small fish these traditional small fish are extremely nutritious because you eat them full with your bones with everything with the eyes with the brain those little fish my until my father passed away 11 years ago from the time that i would remember every day two meals every day on the table there was sprats either dry or fresh sprats on the table for two meals every day 
I don't think he knew about how important the small spread for nutrition. I don't think he knew about we, we are eating calcium and we are eating selenium and we are taking all the omega 3s. That's the tradition. The way forward. We can reach the supply demand gap, I certainly believe. There are issues and problems that finding solutions are not difficult. Most problems are global, but so solutions are local. Um, oops. There is much to learn from our decades of experience, both good and bad. Um, do not forget the small scale sector, I always believe. You can increase. The corporate sector is, everyone wants to do agriculture, everyone wants to do, want to make money. Research, science and technology for improving productivity of both large scale and small scale sectors are extremely important. Don't forget one side. Whatever your efforts, make sure still 70% come from the small scale. If you deprive them, you not only you are reducing the production, but you will deprive their livelihoods. So it has to be market, it has to be competitive. Do not forget the poor. Fish is for all, not only for people who have money. It's not only salmon and shrimp. It is a fish that everyone can afford to buy. Concerted efforts by all concerns are important. When you go home, talk to your peers. Building capacity at all levels, especially supporting poor. Need strong political will. It is the government who will drive. It is the government of China who increased production of aquaculture for the past 30 years. Strong public-private partnerships are extremely important. Um, I think that's all. Uh, I thank uh, FAO, IFRI, World Fish and World Bank for the information. And thank you all for listening to me. If I've taken a little bit longer than expected, I'm sorry about that. Thank you.